couldn't say any better myself, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is uh, my talk on uh, the year, year of mothing I've had. Um, I've been doing moth trapping for probably, this is my fourth, maybe fifth year that I've done it from my garden. Um, so I've had a lot of experience over the time and got to know the basics. Um, and I'll, I'll go through some of them, through, through some of that tonight with you. Um, so yeah, so birds are not just moth food. Um, so there, we've got a photo of a uh, poplar hawk moth. That's not an actual pair of binoculars, that's just a, a USB stick, <laughs> so don't worry. There's a Clifton nonpareil or a blue underwing, which um, I have a few stories about that later on. The uh, bottom uh, left photo is a photo of my trap, which is homemade by uh, my anti-moth recorder back in Leicestershire. So just a big, big massive Tupperware box, a mercury, vul vul a mercury vapor bulb, um, and a funnel really, it's the basics with some egg boxes, um, and a white sheet in case some moths don't go in the trap. And uh, the bottom right is a privet hawk moth, which I don't think you get too many in North Wales, but uh, I got a fair few this year. So uh, there's another photo of um, the blue underwing. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk just a little bit introduction, um, and then like my locate whereabouts I live, give a bit, a bit of like habitat, um, and then I'll go through each month, and then a little bit quick, a quick roundup. Um, at the end of each month, I've got like a few graphs to show the progression throughout the uh, the course of this year to show you how uh, how well this year is and how well it can be for some of the people. Um, so why moths? So that's just a quick. Um, I literally just lifted that off Google. The difference between butterflies and moths. Uh, you've, there's only about 55, 56, maybe a few more species of butterfly in the UK, but for moths, I think there's well over 7,000 different species. A lot of them are little small brown, about two or three millimeter jobs. Um, but here, so the uh, top left, that's your swallowtail butterfly. Um, the top right is a scarce green silver lines, one of my favorites. Um, the bottom left is brown argus butterfly once again. And then uh, the uh, the bottom right is an engrailed, um, which isn't which is plain and boring, which you could say that, but it's more like it's more subtle beauty than anything. Um, so yeah, most moths tend to rest with their wings in like a tent position, how that scarce bordered short the uh, scarce green silver lines is. Um, but then there are, there are other moths like in the bottom right photo that will re rest their wings more like how a butterfly would. So uh, where am I roughly? So I'm like in north northeast Leicestershire. So I'm very close to Melton Mowbray. So pork pies and stilton cheese. That's what I've lived on since a kid. Um, Rutland Water is only about half an hour away. So I'm like between Leicester, Nottingham, and Melton roughly. Um, yeah. So I live in a small village called Grimston. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse. I'm pretty sure you can. Uh, but to the north, we've got a massive pine and coniferous woodland, and little fragmentations of deciduous woodland and arable fields. Um, thick hedgerows and also meadow grassland around um, and then plus all the habitats from what, what all ornamental plants people have in their gardens and um, so it's a good array of habitat within this small region just to the south probably about another mile is a massive uh, river valley um, as well so that that also will help bring up moths because um, they will travel a fair distance overnight so yeah so this is the, lo the location um so the, the big photo that's taken through my phone i think for in the morning of my uh, of my back garden through my bedroom window um so you can actually see the moth trap with the white sheet and that's actually um my uh, bed like my bed table um and all the bird feeders normally most people wouldn't put their moth trap right next to the bird feeders but because i'm getting up at four o'clock every morning to do the trap i'm up before well usually i'm up before the birds get out and have a chance to snack on this massive buffet that they <laughs> that would be on offer to them so i can get away with it but most people tend to put it away from the bird feeders because well for obvious reasons um there's a quick photo of a our garden pond that i dug a few years back um which has definitely helped to contribute to like more aquatic species and then the uh the bottom left photo is just literally just outside uh past the garden there's a massive orchard and like you can see some of that meadowy, meadowy grassland that's actually there being cut for some silage earlier this year so the trap, um, this is just in the stages from the top, from the left. Um, as you can tell, it rained that night. <laughs> um, I think this is before I'd set the trap, actually, because it doesn't look to be anything in it. Um, and then that's how I usually arrange my egg, egg cartons on the inside. So there's no real way to specifically do it. Everyone's got their own technique. But as long as the moth goes in there and doesn't come back out, you're perfectly fine. And then there's a funnel and then I've got some gauze at the bottom of mine um, that is to allow if it does rain the water will go straight into the trap through the funnel and then straight through the bottom 
to allow, um, so I can still trap during the rain for any conditions because some moths will still fly, especially if it's only like a short shower. Uh, so how I record my moths, as you can see, it says 2018 here. This goes all the way back to 2016 um, as well. So this is every night I'll record what I've seen um, as they go. That's from the start of this year where I started. So this will be the, the night after we went into the first lockdown. Um, I don't know how many are on now. Being in Bangor, we've been in lockdown for ages, it seems now. Um, but yeah, so that will go and that will go on throughout the year. Then I'll have a, a slow tools page for how it's going throughout the year like this for each species and then highest number of each species and the number of that species I've caught overall. Um, it sounds very complicated, but if I keep on top of it every day, uh, it's not too bad. So March, um, never really going to get much in March, to be honest. The, the, your prime months are like end of May going through to August. That's like your, that's your prime window. Um, but since I was at home going to be in lockdown, you gave me <laughs> nothing else better to do. Um, so this is actually from my garage, which I tend to uh, trap at a few years back as well. Um, and the light also, the white in the garage roof would help reflect the light that I found. Um, so I just started trapping there, just trying different locations out because it had been a year since I trapped at home. First moth of the year always tends to be Hebrew character. Um, for some of them I have put their, uh, their, their Latin names, for, but for some of those I haven't, I haven't bothered too much. Um, this is a, so this is a micro. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to bother pronouncing <laughs> their scientific names because they, they get more complicated than that. So March Tubic. Um, but for the micro moths, the, the names change, the uh, English names tend to vary, which is a bit annoying. So most people tend to record like the macros. So that's all like your fairly big moths um, by their, their English names. And then the uh, tiny little moths, they'll record by their, their Latin scientific names. Oak beauties. So this is like the the sign that spring's on its way. It's coming around. A bit of colour. Um, these are lovely, as you like oak. They uh, the feed on oak. The caterpillars do, along with other deciduous species. Um, and early grey, which is a fairly common moth, but in my experience in the garden, I've only caught a couple. Um, so I managed to catch two or three this year. So for me, that was a little bit of a personal highlight. Uh, so like marsh is. is there's not much going on in March. I think I only trapped on eight occasions. So this this will and then each month um, I will show these four graphs again, and you'll see how how the year progresses. Um, so not much to show there. Just over seventy moths caught all month, and about what was that eight species. Um, and then these are every every session. Um, so where there's no line, that's where I haven't trapped, and that's probably due to there being too much rain at night. So I haven't bothered. Um, I would normally trap in all conditions, but if it's really, really poor, then I just won't bother. April, um, so this is a early thorn. So this is a, an unusual moth in terms of it rests very similar to a butterfly. Um, and they have, there's a few generations of this of early thorn. They'll come out like March, April time. And then during the summer, there'll be another generation. And then during like September, August time, there's a, there's another, there's a third generation sometimes. Uh, shoulder stripe, which is very, very nice. Um, small little, small little moth. Um, always nice to get a couple of these. They always tend to fly off very quickly. Waved umber, so that's uh, probably like that. Maybe <laughs> I should have brought a ruler or something with me. Um, and muslin moth. So these are really little, fluffy. Got the got the uh, got the uh, fluffy hats on. Um, and this is it's still getting it's still cold at night here. We've not hit double figures yet at nights. So still the numbers are still low compared to what they will be. And pugs, so pugs are very, luckily pugs won't feature much in this, but for those who don't know moths at all or are only just getting into it, pugs are pretty much like trying to identify a really horrible looking gold. Like pugs are the goals of the moth world. That's like the easiest way I can describe it. This is a fairly, fairly fresh looking one. They can get a lot worse than this, as you'll see. Um, so this is a double stripe pug, normally one of the first ones you see. Um, so this is normally one of the first like, ID uh, complications that people can get to into the year. So this is swallow prominence on the uh, on the left, and less a swallow prominence on the right. So the main thing you're looking, if you can see my uh, cursor, is this white line on the left. It's quite long and thin compared to on the right. It's quite like a like a fat wedge. Um, and just to show you what I'm on about, is a uh, I just nick this off uh, someone's Facebook and show you the difference. So it can be very subtle differences you're looking in looking for in some moths. Um, 
But once you're getting your eye in and you're just going through the egg boxes, you're like, yep, 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 that's what that is. That, what, that's what that is. So it, it takes a bit of time to get used to. Um, but it's, it's not just moths that you catch. So on the left there, that was a uh, that was a early thorn, not the same one that I showed you in one of the previous photos, but that uh, I think it's like a huntsman spider or something, managing to stand up on all fours and drag that well all eight and drag that away with it, and uh, a d massive diving beetle. Um, so they they do get attracted to light, and I will later on throughout the year as I start catching loads of little tiny beetles, wasps, hornets, and um, I only caught a few of these massive diving beetles, but I always made sure to uh, to, to pop them in the pond because um, I, I don't really have anything. Like that in the pond, um, but I do now. <laughs> so this is uh, yeah definitely the celebration moment of the year, catching your first hawk moth. So hawk moths are like wake up in the morning, looking in the trap, and I don't know, finding a bird of paradise in your back garden or something. It's like they're the the bird of paradise, bird of paradise of the moth world. Um, we can't beat a, a hawk moth. They're just oh, they're, just, they're, they're brilliant. So this is lime hawk moth. Um, I previously only caught one of these in the garden in my past four years, so I was extremely, yeah, I was very excited to say, say the least. I think I woke up the neighbours at four o'clock in the morning when I, say, <laughs> I saw this in the trap. Um, but that is the beauty of moth trapping. It's like Christmas every morning. You've got no idea what you're going to catch. You wake up in the morning and you open it, and it might be really bad, but when it's good, it's good. Um, and yeah, if, if you've been a good boy, <laughs> then uh, you get good moths. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so we're moving in on into April, and I've, over 250 moths, almost 300 moths caught during April. Um, and of, of course, as you're going into spring, you're going to catch more species, um, which you can see quite easily there. Um, and yeah, so you can see it's starting to get, so you can tell when the warmer nights are because there's little spikes in the uh, the catch totals. So there, I think, was that around the 28th, 27th of April, I caught over, over 20 species, which for April is not too bad. And going into May now, things really start going. So this is a brimstone. Um, it's not a brim, very similar to the brimstone butterfly. But this is the brimstone moth. Um, buff ermine. I love these little fellas. Um, I catch quite a few of them, so which is quite lucky. Um, very similar to the muslin moth in terms of the really fluffy head, but they're a little bit longer, a bit bigger, and just this yellowish black colour in general. These are some of the micros that I'm on about. This is probably about three millimeters long. It's a fairly common one. I'm just going to say common slender. I'll let you guys try and pronounce <laughs> pronounce that name. Um, but I thought I'd just show you what some of the really, really small moths would look like. Um, and I'd quite often catch a few of these and it would take me like all day to sometimes identify these. Um, so ones that I wasn't sure on, I'd put them in little pots um, and then I'd put them in the fridge, which my mum never likes um, waking up in the morning and going down to make a cup of tea or something and opening the fridge and there's just a, <laughs> a fridge load of moths. Um, but what that does is it, it, it doesn't kill them. It just kills them a little bit and they go into a sleep, um, kind of like a mini hibernation. So it, it really doesn't affect them. You could potentially leave a moth in there for about a week. I, tend, I know some people do, but I, ethically, I, that's not, I don't do that. Usually a day or two at the max. Um, but because sometimes some of these fellas are really worn or they're really active and you just can't tell what they are, so you just whack them in the fridge for a bit, let them cool down, pop them back out, and then you've got like a minute or two before they warm up, before they, you release them and you lose them around the kitchen like many times happened this year. And there's probably some, some still in the kitchen somewhere that I haven't told my mum, but I'm sure she'll find them. Uh, so yeah, I said I, I trap in all weather. So on the, on the left there, I've moved the trap. Um, I think we had some really, really strong winds. And uh, there you go, there's one of my dogs, that's Pixie. Uh, <laughs> And I've completely battered down the hatches there with the, uh, the moth sheet to make sure it wouldn't fly away. Um, and then on the right, I, um, I'd risked it and saw that the weather was going to be bad, but I thought, oh, you're right. And uh, it was pretty much like a monsoon that morning. So I quickly had to rush the trap, put it into the garage um, and process it there. But it meant I had plenty of wet egg boxes to dry out. Um, I got through a few, a fair few of them this year. Beautiful golden wye, um, a, a very stun a stunning moth. Um, very similar to the silver wire, which is like a migrant that some of you may have seen um, just on your daily walks. So they're quite a day flying moth. Um, but this is more like a damp, wet woodland deciduous species um, that I'm quite lucky to see a few of. And yes, yeah, so the hawk moth season is here. So this is poplar hawk moth, probably one of the commonest. Some of you may have seen these. An elephant, which I think everyone, most people will have seen what an elephant hawk moth looks like. This uh, pink and green monster of a moth. Um, that uh, so if you've got any, I'm trying to think of the, I can't remember the um, the plant now. I can't remember the plant's gone from the top of my head. It's a really common like weedy uh, plant. It probably comes willow herb. That's it. 
you've got any willow herb in the uh, Rose Bay willow herb, um, the caterpillars of these will, uh, will eat that. And they're a fairly common moth. Like, if you've gone throughout the year and not caught an elephant or moth, that's uh, yeah, it's a bit unlucky on your behalf. <laughs> The uh, privet hawk moth, which, like I said, I don't think you get too many in North Wales. This is the largest um, breeding moth we have in the UK. And so that's my finger, that my thumb, if that gives you any, any reference to how big they are. They're monsters, these fellas. Um, they're that lovely pink and black abdomen. Um, it's very distinctive. And on the back of the head, they've got like that, uh, that skull and crossbones. Very similar to, that's the, um, the Punisher logo from like the Marvel comics. <laughs> There's also the rarer um, death's head hawk moth, which is more of a migrant and it's like even bigger than this and it's orange and black and white and more striking. That's got more of a definitive skull and crossbones, how you'd expect on like a pirate's flag, for example. And uh, eyed hawk moth. So before going into this year, um, there was a few species that I wanted to catch that over the four years I haven't caught and eyed hawk moth was one of them. It's a fairly common hawk moth that will feed on like apple and willow which I have loads around in, in my village and where I live. And it was, I found to catch one at some stage. Um, and yeah, there was, there was definitely, um, I say a few French words <laughs> used when I opened up the trap and saw that in with the, uh, opens up its wings and you, those eyes very much like a peacock butterfly. Um, and I actually managed to catch quite a few this year, um, which oh, was definitely, definitely a good sign. Um, gold spot as well. So this is another damp, wet woodland moth that when you uh so on they're both the same species but on the, the one on the right is a little bit more worn one of the less very pr is very pristine if you hold them in the light um it's very metallic and reflective and it, it really does shimmer and give you that give you that gold effect and uh, i was talking about um drab and awful looking pugs that are like um like gulls so i i caught this this pug and i had no idea what it was at all so i potted it and took a photo and uh, put it in my local Facebook group for like Leicestershire moths. And uh, I think the county recorder, by the sounds of his comments, kind of like jumped off his chair. And uh, so it's called a pinion spotted pug and it's extremely worn. But if you look, it's got these two black marks, which are called disco mar marks. And there's like little, little V's and little bits of brown splodges that apparently made it a pinion spotted pug. Um, and plenty of other people agreed that it was pinion spotted, but it was the uh, only the eighth county record for Leicestershire since 2000 um, and someone else further if you can see on, on my cursor a bit further up to the uh, to the northeast of the county caught one on the same night so it's a it's a species that likes hedgerows but it's just still not very common at all in Leicestershire so that was that's probably my rarest find this year um, but completely by accident and you know like this is what I mean you never know what you're going to catch you might just catch loads of common stuff but then from time to time you're going to catch an absolute worldie of a <laughs> Of a, uh, of a record um, but if this star is where my garden is roughly and in that uh, 10 kilometer tetrad there are no other people that moth trap at the moment um, so all of my records for there's a new atlas coming out for the county so all my records at the moment are very helpful um, on plotting where the population of moths are in the county so uh, on that map the uh, splodges in the dots in green are the records like pre-2000 and then the records uh, of uh, like from 2000 to the present day are the ones in red, so the more recent ones. Um, so there is one or two near me, um, but not many. Uh, I started to find that when I was doing the trap that moths were starting to fly away um, and I had a few bits and bobs lying around and I didn't really want to buy a, uh, buy a net. So I, uh, I found an old tennis racket and an old um, pillow sheet and plenty of duct tape and <laughs> Made myself my own uh, little uh, flick net, and uh, yeah, it it worked. Like it could, if I'd bought a proper one, it would have worked a hell of a lot better. But it it did its job. Um, that was just I pretty much got bored by this stage. I'd finished all my uni work, had the whole summer to do, and uh, yeah, <laughs> that's what I ended up doing. Um, I caught quite a few puff puff tips. So these are like birch twigs. Um, really, really common. Most people catch these even in really urban gardens. Um, they're really, really nice looking moths. So here we get end of May, and you can really see that we've gone, we're now into spring. The number of moths has absolutely skyrocketed in like species and totals. So I'm now over, over 1600 moths for the year and uh, over 140 species for the year. Um, so it's really starting to pick up. And, uh, and here you can see compared to like April and May, how, how good May gets, or between March and April and how good May gets. But uh, it, it'll get a lot better. 
Um, so now we're into June and things are really, really starting to, uh, to hot up. So these are peppered moths. Um, they come in a few different forms, but it, they're, uh, if anyone has kids that are doing like A-level biology or GCSE biology, you, you learn about these, these little fellas because um, you can tell the, how good the air pollution is around you due to these. If there's a really sooty gray, well, sooty and black in general color, there's no white on them, then that generally indicates that you've got really low levels of uh, air pollution. Um, I've only I've never caught a full black one where I live. I've, I've only caught these uh these pristine. I forget they've got a little scientific name. Of course they do. Um, but I only I only seem to catch these fellas. Um, I still manage to catch quite a few. Um, and uh, yeah, so starting to catch more elephant or hawk moths. And this one's clearly being at some stage in the day, uh, not in the trap because this was actually in the trap. But at some stage, this has been nabbed by a, a bird of some sort and it's had a chunk taken out of its wing. But the, the moths are very hardy. Like they were, I've seen some ones that look almost dead, and they're still able to fly and feed. They're clearly on their last legs, but they'll still keep going. Um, <laughs> yeah, how many is too many? So this was, I think, fourteen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, fourteen. I think there was in total this day. Elephant hawk moths. Um, that was my garden record, and you can see even from this photo, you've got some really, really nice in the middle here. Some really nice pristine conditions. Um, individuals and then over to the left there's a few more worn on the top of the head and on the back um, and yeah I managed to catch 145 elephant hawk moths this year which is um, I've never had I've never even hit like over 50 before in the garden let alone 145 and this was just a common theme throughout the course of the year for just all species like even species that I'd caught in previous years I'd only caught one of this year I'd catch 10 or 20 of them um, so clearly all the dry, wet, the dry, humid weather we had in 2019 has affected this year um, and it's due to a bumpy year. And I think the, the weather was very similar this year. So next year could be even better potentially. But it's, uh, and also with climate change, et cetera, the moths are coming out earlier and there's more of them. So these are all factors that are all, that all play a part. Um, so yeah, this is a photo that was, oh, how old am I here? Dare I say. Um, 15 potentially so this is at Langard during a BTO bird camp um, that I was volunteering on and this is on this girl's finger is a uh, and yeah that's me in the back that's a uh, small elephant hawk moth and this was the only one I'd ever seen and this was the only other hawk moth apart from the eyed that I showed you earlier that I hadn't caught in the garden and I was like I'm, I'm going to get one this year they are quite rare in Leicestershire but it's, it's my year it's I'm going to catch one this year and um, yep I got one and <laughs> was very excited so that's next to a, uh, a like your normal common uh, elephant hawk moth, and you can see the size difference and, and why they're called a small elephant hawk moth. Um, they are they are tiny, um, but that was the only one I caught all year. I never caught it again. Um, and just goes to show that if you catch a moth one night and release it, you're not going to catch it the same night. Some people argue that if you're trapped every night, which is what I tend to do, um, you're only catching the same moths. But it's really there's, there's loads of evidence to disagree with that and uh, I tend to once I've processed the moths I put them back in the trap put a cover on the trap so they can't get out put them in a shaded spot the entire day so they don't like bake and overheat and then come dusk I will go and walk 100 maybe two or 300 meters down the lane um, and go and release them in some hedgerows that I know there's going to be like a flock of house sparrows in or something um, and go and release them so then they're away from the garden so every day I know I'm not I'm not catching I'm not getting recapture results and, um, and it really does work. So here, yeah, this is that silage meadow that I was on about that's right next to the house. My house is just the other side of this little meadow to the left. Um, and then to, to the right over there, that's the, uh, the orchard that's got plum, that's got like dams and plums in and uh, all sorts of great uh, apples, pears, raspberries. It's, yeah, it's got its fair share. And you can see at the back there, some of the hedgerows that I've got around me are really, really thick, um, which, which is really really good, not just for the bird, for the butterflies, but also in the moths, but also the uh, the birds around here as well. Um, and this is some are really starting to pick up now. So this is a swallowtail moth that are really probably like that in size, really good few centimeters in length. Um, very very pretty leopard moth. Um, this is one that I'd only caught one in the garden before, and I'd accidentally overslept my alarm and come out to the garden and uh, I just found its wing, a moth, had, uh, a, moth a, a bird had actually eaten it. So I was a bit gutted. So when I found this one this year, I was like, yes, I've, I, <laughs> I've, uh, 
I've done it. I finally got one. Um, the first one I ever saw of these was actually crushed outside the, uh, the my local co-op on the floor. Um, I, I did get a few weird looks when I hit, like peeled it off from the concrete. Um, but they're, they're very weird looking moths for sure. And the uh, peach blossom. This is one, personally one of my favourite moths. Um, it doesn't really show it in this photo, but they really are proper peachy in colour and they're nice and brown with that contrast, contrasting white. And uh, before this year, I'd only catch one a year. So I was looking forward to catching my one this year. I think I caught 12 this year. <laughs> not, that I, uh, not that I took them for granted, but uh, just insane the numbers I was catching. Uh, there we go. So this is plain golden wire, very similar to the beautiful that I showed earlier. I should have put these two on the same slide. Um, but again, even like even in the middle of summer, you're still going to get a few brown looking moths. And there are plenty of brown moths that I haven't shown in these, I should say that. Um, I've only picked the really nice looking ones. Um, but even the, most of the brown looking ones still look, if you put them in the right light, they, look, they do look good. And uh, here's the scare silver lines. Um, I, only, I think I caught two this year, but they are one of my favourites. That's, like that's a proper apple green, almost like a male green finch, like a pristine adult male green finch as a moth. That's what this is. Um, just lovely, lovely in colour and fairly big as well. Probably, probably like two or three inches in size. They're very big moth. Um, and probably one of my also rare records was I never actually, this never actually landed in the trap. I just like about midnight went out to go and check the trap, see what was around. And this moth landed on the inside of the underside of this leaf. Um, and I, sadly, I didn't manage to pot it, but I managed to get this photo. And it's um, a scallop shell. And as you can see from the map on the right, um, there's, a, there's very much a divide in the county. Um, and despite there being, so to the, to the right, that's Rutland. And despite there being loads of recent records in Rutland, this was the first in eastern Leicestershire for about 10 years. So it wasn't just a good record because it's kind of like in the middle of Leicestershire in that band, but also it was the first just eastern record for about 10 years as well. Um, and like I said, I'm the only person that traps in my tetrad as well. So that's another species that's been added to that area for the new atlas that's coming out. But these are all really worthy records. Um, every night you trap, it's always it's like gold dust. You never know what you're going to get. And uh, yeah, and uh, you, you thought May was skyrocketing. The totals in June absolutely kicked off massively. Uh, there's over 3,000 quarts. Um, so this would take me probably about half an hour to an hour every morning to go through because I'll be catching two or 300 moths a morning. Um, as you can see, the total species has started to, uh, to slightly level off, but they're, st they're still increasing a good amount. But the, uh, the number of new species has dropped a little bit. So I'm still catching most of the species I caught in May, but of course I'm now catching new species in June as well, which, which, which does help. Um, but I don't, actually, I don't actually get many more moths in terms of new, uh, new species. Like May was kind of like the, uh, my peak arrival, which was very interesting. I was expecting more June, uh, June July time. And here you can see that I'm, one night I caught almost 90, just under 90 species in a night in June. And I'm catching, they go 350 uh, plus moths and two nights in a row. So like your ideal conditions are really warm, muggy nights, no moon, um, and potentially a bit of rain that's gone in the afternoon. The moths are a bit wet and like early, early evening they want to dry themselves off and they'll be out. So if it's like 20 plus degrees all night, cloud cover, humid like really humid you're in for a good night they're 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 the, they're the nights we dream of <laughs> as mothers uh, not mothers but mothers um and now moving into july this this is this is the big month definitely um so this is a black arches that I, I managed to catch a few of this year this is a proper oak woodland or deciduous wood, woodland speciality um very very stunning moth and the underwing on some of these can be a bit a bit of a pink hue i'm not sure if you can see that um, but yeah, they're very stunning. So I, I think that was the mo the highest number of buff tips I caught eight, all year, um, eight. So that's a, I wouldn't just catch one or two of these. I'd catch like say eight or nine of them in a night um, at times. And uh, most of these I'd probably never caught before. It just goes to show there's so many moths flying around the garden. You've, you've got no idea until you start trapping. Um, these are some of the moths that I haven't shown you. So this is an ermine um, species that Sadly, you can't really tell most of them apart unless you have to, you have to kill, they have to be dead and you have to dissect them. But I don't really bother with that because I don't see much point because most of them are all going to be one species anyway. Um, this is a, I'd actually, this is on my kitchen tap. Um, they're 
flown around the uh, the kitchen, me running around with a pot trying to get it. Um, but it wasn't until it landed that I found it. Um, and yeah, elephant hawk moths, just. So this is what I mean, that some of the moths are on their, literally their last legs. Like there is no scales left on that, that hawk moth. You can barely tell it even is an elephant hawk moth. Um, I did see it and was like, what is that? Bit of crazy. Um, but I, I would be surprised if that lasted another day because that is literally on its last legs. I've never seen a moth like, look like that before. Um, well, definitely isn't a moth. And um, this is so. This is a toad, and I, I get the odd frog in my pond, but very very rarely have toads in the garden. So this was a, this was a welcome surprise to say the least. And there's a looks like there's a spider in the back there. I've just realised. Um, <laughs> this is yep. Yeah, still catching private hawk moths, and there's a is that a less. So there's a swallow prominent as well to the corner there. I'm just trying to look for that wedge. Um, and yeah, so very often you'd open the trap and the, the hawk moths would just spray, spray their wings out straight away as a defense, um, giving you that lovely color. And uh, a bingo. So this is the last hawk moth species I've caught this year. That like the, all the breeding hawk moth species, the six or seven of them. And this was the final one I needed for the year. So this is pine hawk moth. I usually only catch one a year. So I was like, I was waiting for my time and it was getting quite late. I was getting a bit worried. But this is a pristine, maybe that's a better photo, pristine um, adult. All the ones I've caught in the past have been really, really, really just worn. Um, it is a very grey like moth in general, and compared to the rest of the hawk moths, it is very grey. But uh, it's still a, still a really, really big size fella. Um, but they're really, really nice. The drinker. This is a this is an odd moth, very odd. Um, there's big beady eyes, um, and you'll often find the caterpillars if like around reed beds. Um, and they oh, they're really, really, really weird looking things. Um, really fluffy as well. The kids love them. Um, white satin. So this is really like like a proper satin white, satin, almost like a satin sheet has just gone over this moth. Um, and I, I managed to catch a few of these, which is nice. Uh, this is another personal favourite of mine, but you never quite get the uh, the proper coloration of it on a on a camera, sadly. And uh, so that's, uh, here we are, it's July finished. Um, and I'm still increasing, number of moth totals is still going up and up and up. Um, over 5,000 now uh, for July, over 10,000 for the year. And I've still got August and September to go. Um, and there you can see like June, July, I think there was only one species in it in terms of new species each month. But all, the me all the species that I've caught in May, in May and June, I'm still catching in July as well. So it's just a massive increase. Um, and yeah, there we go. That just shows once again the totals going through uh, through July. So it's still trapping most nights. You can see the odd night that I haven't trapped, probably due to it being extremely windy or just monsoon weather all night, probably. And uh, and moving into August, so I only managed to trap for two or three weeks in August because I went away to uh, Suffolk for a week. Um, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, I've got friends, a lot of friends down there who are like big into moths, and I just spent the week there mothing. That was my kind of holiday, not sitting and relaxing, like enjoying the sun. It was getting up at four o'clock in the morning, doing moth traps, driving somewhere else, doing more moth traps, and just <laughs> just keep going throughout the day. Um, but this is a silver Y that I found like completely away from the uh, the trap, actually the other end of the garden, the other side of the house, on the garden shed. Um, just just found that just as the as you do. Um, yeah, and the invasion begins as you come into August. Large yellow window wings are absolute pain. Um, fairly big. You most probably most most of you have probably seen one of these in your. They probably come to light in your house like in in August, um, or you've trapped one in your garage by accident. These are probably the most common moth that most people have seen. Um, and some nights I'm catching one or two hundred, maybe even three hundred of these a night. Um, and when you're trying to look for other moths, and these things are just bouncing around in there and disturbing everything, it's an absolute nightmare. Nightmare. Um, we tend to call, call them blunder wings for that reason. Still catching hawk moths, so this is just another poplar hawk moth. Um, so of course you have a few generation of the generations of these um, throughout the whole year. And uh, I've hit the magical number. So this is once I saw this moth, it was like right, autumn is now here. Sallows are uh, is typically an like an autumn species. So this is centre barred sallow, but this was also my 400th species of the year. So this was probably about mid-August, and I'd already hit 400 species. Um, it was it was going to slow down soon, but I was tr I was getting close to that 400. I just wanted to hit that milestone, and I'd done it. Um, and yes, yeah, so here's a hornet. Um, I, I'll show you some more photos, but I tended to catch a few of these hornets. Um, 
and on a few, I had a, started to get a bit of a wasp wasp problem. Um, that I was catching potentially 60, 70 wasps a night that were attracted to the light. Luckily, not many of them were killing the moths. They were just attracted to the light, but there was the odd one or two. It did start to become a problem. Um, so I tried moving the trap around or not trapping for a night just to give the, the wasps time to, to merge, well, move on. Um, it didn't make a difference. But what was always interesting was the wasps would survive, but the hornets, most of the hornets wouldn't. What we found was that um, when the moths are flying around in the trap once they're in, the, uh, their scales or the moth dust goes in the air and the, uh, the hornets actually start to suffocate from that because they're so big, um, which is something I didn't know until this year. Um, and it makes a lot of sense because in the bottom of the trap, there's always a lot of, there's always going to be the old one or two moth that's died. Not all of them survive. Not going to be here and tell you every moth does because they don't. Um, there's the odd one that does die, but you're never going to get massacred, a trap that's massacred on the inside unless you have a load of wasps or a load of hornets that will just eat their way through everything or a bird gets stuck in your trap, which I know is happened to a few people. But yeah, here we go into the Suffolk mini holiday. Um, so this is an archer's dart, very much an East Coast sandy speciality. So this is at Langard uh, Bird Observatory next to Felixstowe Port. Um, managed to see a few of these. So these are all completely new to me. Um, I think in terms of my moth list is probably on about 500, but there were still loads and loads I hadn't seen. Um, and this was a great week to see like loads of new life is for me almost. It was like going to another country, just being absorbed by all these new species. This is a salt marsh plume. So this is a really, really odd looking thing with those two like prongs sticking out the side of its head. Um, and this is probably in, like a good inch or two in size, but this is also more of an East Coast speciality. Um, and this was taken by a friend, Justin, um, in his garden. And, and here we go. This is the, uh, the big beauty. <laughs> um, when it comes to, to moths, the hawk moths are the, um, what did I call them, the birds of paradise. But in terms of like your proper mothers who will potentially go and twitch another moth, there's always one that you want to catch. And this is, this is it, the Clifton uh, nonpareil or the, uh, the blue underwing. This is like the Siberian ruby throat or white thrush of, uh, of the moth world. It's a migrant, but a few are starting to now colonize like Kent in uh, southern England. Um, but these are massive in size. They're probably two or three inches along and then about two or three inches like in like width and size, like <laughs> if I was to do that. They are massive. And, and whilst I was away, um, I was going to go to a moth night that had been organized, of course, all COVID safe and everything, keeping a distance. Um, but uh, one had been caught just down the road. So before we went to this moth night, we, we thought, oh, can you uh, keep, <laughs> keep the moth in the fridge for a few more hours so we can come and see it? And, uh, and this is it. Um, this is the first one I'd ever seen, my friend and I had ever seen. Um, this is all it opened its wings, which is really annoying. It's got really, really blue on the wings very much like these. Um, so these are taken by some friends in uh, on the south coast um, in like, I think one was in Essex and one was in uh, in Cornwall. So these are proper migrants and you can really see that that really nice blue. So when they'll sit in the trap, the, uh, the wings will be closed and it'll just look really, really brown and boring. And then once you startle it, that flash of blue. But on the underside, they're really white and black. And when they, we, the one that we saw, we were allowed to release it. And once they fly off, they literally look, if you've ever seen a hoopoe in flight, that black and white in the wing, these just look like miniature hoopoes in flight. It's so weird watching these fly off. Um, but uh, one was also caught in uh, in North Wales this year. That was a first. <laughs> um, a, some of you might recognise that photo, or that person anyway. And that's the size of the Clifton. So that was one, I'm not even going to try, try and pronounce the name of that place, but that's where it was. Um, caught by, I think, the, the uh, local county recorder near here. And that was the first for North Wales as well. So uh, thank you, Louis, for, <laughs> for this photo. I'm sure Steve will appreciate. Um, so yeah, people will go and twitch moths like these. Um, people call them fridge tickers. But uh, for a special moth like this, um, it's, it really is worth it. These are fantastic moths to see. Um, and here's a few more species from my little trip. So this is a barred red. So it's very much a southern species and more of a breckland species was where we were staying in Suffolk, we were right next to the Brex, so we were catching a lot of specialities there. And uh, on the right is uh, the box tree moth, which some of you may have seen, or oh, the Sun and the Daily Mail always go on about it, showing that bush is absolutely covered in moths, saying there's a massive invasion coming, keep your kids away, especially if you've got asthma or something, because oh, these caterpillars are infectious or something. This is the moth that they're on about, uh, the box tree moth, um, which, is a, which is a migrant, but it is also invasive to box trees. 
Um, and it is, I think it is starting to become a slight problem. I don't think it's too bad yet. Um, I've never, I've never seen one. I'd never seen one myself in Leicestershire, but this, so this was in Suffolk. We saw a couple, and they actually have quite a nice shimmer, like a purple sheen to them. Um, yeah, quite a nice moth. But I know some people would actually do once they catch them, will go around the corner and uh, humanely dispose of them. Let's say because they're technically classed as an invasive species these days. Um, so I'm back home, and uh, I managed to catch a few red underwings. So I thought, oh, I should probably try and see if I can. <laughs> how how can I string this into my own blue underwing? But I uh, used a bit of paint, and yeah, I don't think it was convincing enough. Uh, yeah, close but no cigar. Um, these are, but they don't always come to light. Uh, red underwings, um, but I managed to catch a few this this year, and they are they are a decent size, very similar to that Clifton photo that um, Steve was uh, nicely uh, modelling for us. And uh, yeah, as we move into September, these, these are most of these are sallows. Then the uh, top left, that's the centre barred sallow that I showed earlier. And then these are uh, the middle two. They're barred sallows, which were new for the for the year that this night. And then it hasn't really come out. But this bottom left one is a really yellowy, uh, like a lemony yellow colour. So this is uh, sallow itself. And then there's frosted orange, which is very similar to the gold spot I showed a while back. That when you shimmer it in the light, the gold metallic it really does reflect. And it, like, you can clearly see the autumn's here. All these are really like yellowy, orange, brown colours. It's really starting to get to that time of year. Um, and uh, also when you start getting into late August, into September, you start getting migrants from the continent. So this is a rusty dot pearl, which is a, which is a micro. Um, and if you lived in Kent or Cornwall or somewhere, you could probably catch 50, 60 of these, and, of these a night and uh, you just dismiss them really. Oh, oh look, there's another rusty dot pearl. This was the first for me this year, and I've only ever caught two before this. So um, it was a nice garden record. You do get them in Leicestershire, but of course you're not going to get the number of migrants that you actually do on the south coast. They're just wood spurts. And yes, yeah, so here are some. These are two hornets I caught in the trap one morning. These both survived. The um, I try and get them out of the pots. Um, I've managed to get a way of using my finger and quickly getting them into the pot. But the one on the right, I kind of uh, didn't realise how active he was and. Uh, yeah, it gave me a little sting. Um, well, I wouldn't say a little sting. It really, really, <laughs> it really hurt. Um, if you've never been stung by a hornet, I don't recommend it. If you've been stung by a wasp, imagine that, but about 10 times was bad. Um, hornets, oh my gosh. And the bite as well. It's, it's not very nice. Um, I definitely woke up my neighbours when that went off at about five o'clock in the morning. Um, another really, really, really nice um, autumn moth is a uh, black rustic. Uh, almost like a Darth Vader-y looking moth, uh, really, really smart, especially all of these are pristine, this really nice black velvet in colour. And uh, yeah, autumn continues and lunar underwings um, start to come into play. So these are all lunar underwings, but different variations of the same species. Um, and they can throw a few people because you can get a few species that look very similar, such as like, well, I think beaded chestnut's the first one that comes to mind. Um, and yeah, I still get thrown by some of these. Um, a while back, Steve posted a photo in a uh, in a group of um, of one, and I said it was a lunar underwing, and it was a beaded chestnut. So I, we all still make mistakes. Um, and uh, I'm always catching quite a few of these lunar underwings, as you can see. Um, and also a lot of these ground beetles, I, I catch loads of them. They're all they're all alive. Um, so yeah, you've got all of these are uh, lunar underwings. Um, there's there's two large yellow underwings if you can see my mouse towards the right. Um, and then on, at the bottom, um, on the egg carton, that looks to be a, a copper underwing. Um, but I caught a few of them as well throughout the year. Um, but I'd only catch like normally five or ten of these lunar underwing a night. Um, and I was worried this year because I was it was getting quite late before I was catching them. Um, and I was worried I wasn't going to catch any. And then one night I caught five, and then I caught eight, and then I caught 30, and then I caught 70, and then I caught like 150 in a night. The numbers absolutely skyrocketed. Um, and then, so, and then this happened. So I think about three o'clock in the morning, I'd just woken up, just, I just couldn't sleep or something. I thought oh, I'd have a look out the window and see if I can see anything from the trap. Um, and there was like, what is that next to the trap to the right of it? Um, I have had hedgehogs in the garden before, but that is probably the biggest rat I, <laughs> I have ever seen. Um, sadly, I do have a, uh, a grain dryer about 500 meters up the road, but don't normally get rats in the garden. And I've never seen one this big. This photo doesn't show it, this was on my phone. But it was massive. Um, and it was clearly chomps in a way at the moths and having an absolute buffet. I haven't got a video to show, um, 
but I think I should have caught about 300 moths that night and I only caught about 100 because there were just moth wings everywhere. Luckily, there was nothing rare in the moth wings. I did check them, um, mostly all like lunar underwings and large yellows, but it, w it was a bit annoying. And uh, and yeah, so this is this is almost this is pretty much come to the end. This is the end of the year now because I uh, I came back to Bangor about mid to late September, um, so I couldn't finish the uh, the month off. And the, uh, I finished on just over six. It was about seventeen thousand moths in the end. Um, and as you can see in the uh, the bottom left graph there, it'll keep going up, and you see that June July is your your peak, and then you will start to drop off. But you're still catching massive numbers. Um, and there, there go new species per month on the bottom right there. You can see that September really starts to slow when you get into the autumn. Um, and there, that is, that's, every, that's the totals from every single session I did over the course of this year. Um, so you can see that gap around the 25th of August. That's the big gap where I was in Suffolk for. Um, which probably, I probably could have been close to 18,000, maybe 19,000 moths if I'd stayed at home that week. Because it was very warm. Um, but you can't do everything. So yeah, so this is to wrap up my totals for the year. I trapped on 152 nights from lockdown till like mid -sep September, for over 17,000 moths, 407 species, 149 of those species were new for that 10 kilometer tetrad or rare, so that's less than 10 ever records. And uh, it bumped up my garden list to 463. Of course, I'd already been trapping over the years, um, but, yeah, I'm, I think next year over the summer, if I'm at home or whatever happens due to COVID, um, I'm definitely going to wait to get to that 500 because that'd be, that'd be a great milestone. Um, and that's a that's a lovely purple thorn um, that also has a very similar to like that butterfly pose. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much. And there's just a, a quick photo showing uh, some of my highlights. I hope I haven't put anyone to sleep. <laughs> Thanks, Toby.